Hi everyone. I had a question regarding the timing of the ceiling of the 144,000. I already briefly touched on that in my video about salvation in the tribulation, but since then I have seen more details, so I think it is worth making a separate video on this. If you haven't read Revelation in a while, it might be advisable to read the first chapters again, maybe until verse 9 of chapter 8, so that you have a background for what I will be talking about here and can see the context of what I am about to say. Now, this seems to be a totally unimportant issue at first glance, but when one has a closer look at it, one will find that not only is the book of Revelation very precise about it, but it also has the potential to have a positive impact on how we view our witness to and prayer for unsaved family and friends. First, let's make clear who the 144,000 are. They are literal Jews and their number is composed of 12,000 of them from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are going to be one of the main vessels of the proclamation of the gospel in the tribulation period. The reason we know this is because in Revelation 7 it tells us that they get sealed so that the judgments that are about to unfold cannot harm them, and after that we see a great multitude that gets saved. In chapter 14, verse 4, they are called the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. The first fruits are a small sample of a main harvest yet to come. From the way they are being described, it becomes clear that they are the first to benefit from the blessings of the new covenant that God promised for the house of Israel. In the book of Revelation, we are being given some very concrete time markers, and those are significant. The first we find in the first chapter, where John is given an outline of the temporal structure of the vision he is receiving. It says in verse 19, Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. He is being told to write down that which he has seen, which was a vision of the glorified Christ in the middle of the seven lampstands, the churches. Then, the things which are, this is the present dispensation of the church age that had already started at the time when John received the vision and still endures until today, but is coming to a close now. Last, the things that will take place after these things. In the Greek, after these things is translated meta tauta. This is a clear outline and tells us right from the beginning that after the church age there are things that will take place and this already tells us right here that those events will not be events the church has anything to do with. A second meta tauta is found in Revelation 4 verse 1. Here it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Again, the question we must ask ourselves is, after what things? Well, up to that point, we read about this, the letters to the seven churches, the golden lampstands that John saw in chapter 1. There are things that will happen after the church age. In order for them to unfold, the church must be out of the way first. John sees a door standing open in heaven and hears the same voice as the voice he heard in chapter 1, the voice of the Son of Man. It is Jesus, of course, who also said of himself that he is the door. The door is not on earth, but in heaven. This is a picture of the rapture when, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, we will hear Jesus' voice and meet him in the air. The church is called up to heaven, and from that heavenly perspective, 
will then witness the things that must take place after she is gone. As a matter of fact, the 24 elders, who represent the church, are present in heaven when the Lamb opens the first seal. That is another indicator that the church gets raptured before the tribulation starts. At this point, they already have their crowns, which shows that the Bema seed already lies in the past. John, as a representative of the church, called to come up before the tribulation starts, is one of the clear puzzle pieces that speak of the pre-tribulational rapture. After that, the church isn't mentioned anymore as the events that start to unfold on the earth are being described. Note also that it says that the things that will transpire after the rapture must take place. This is not optional or anything man would be able to control or turn around. The judgments of the tribulation, the coming of the Antichrist, the persecution of the saints during that time, but also the salvation of great multitudes and the keeping of the remnant who will become believers at the second coming, are fixed events to happen. Things getting better and better, the church ruling and reigning and establishing the kingdom on this earth, thus creating the conditions for Jesus to come back, is a man-made counterfeit, an absolute opposition to what the word tells us. God has decreed that these things must take place. Now, let's get to the meta tauta that is of interest for us here. We find it in Revelation 7, verse 1. It speaks of the sealing of the 144,000. Again, we have to ask ourselves, after which things? This is not so very difficult, because up to that point, what has already taken place are six seal judgments. This tells us that the sealing of the 144,000 takes place during the first half of the tribulation, however, not at the very beginning. In addition to the clear time marker after this, we get another very precise clue. Let us read the first verses of chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Clearly, the angel does not say here, do not bring the four horsemen before they are sealed. Instead, what are the four angels doing? They hold back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. We find that again in the first two trumpet judgments. Let's read this too. It's in chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown on the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. In chapter 7 we are told that the judgment of the earth, the sea, and the trees was held up until the 144,000 were sealed, so that they could not be harmed by them and fulfill their ministry. Here, we now see those judgments that were held back until then taking place. A third of the earth is harmed, of the trees, and so is a third of the sea. So, very clearly, the 144,000 are sealed after the sixth seal judgment and before the trumpet judgments. Now, you might ask, well, 
that's an interesting piece of information. But what is so significant about it? Well, let's connect some more dots here and hopefully you will see why then. The description of who exactly the tribes are that constitute the 144,000 ends in verse 8 of chapter 7. Then we get another meta tauta in verse 9. Here it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So, after the sealing of the 144,000, great multitudes are getting saved. After the sixth seal. This is, however, not the first time we see a crowd of people getting saved. Let's have a look at the fifth seal, which we find in chapter 6, starting from verse 9. There it says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So, as we have already established, this is an event that takes place before the sealing of the 144,000. We also see that, obviously, multitudes getting saved and martyrs and martyred happens in waves. Here they are being told that more were to join them at a later point. As we have seen, another wave happens after the sealing of the 144,000. Note also that these martyrs here of the fifth seal, and also those of the ministry of the 144,000, are not being martyred for not worshipping the beast or not taking its mark. It only says it is because of their testimony. When John inquires about the group of martyrs he seized after the sealing of the 144,000, he is being told that they have washed their robes and have made them clean in the blood of the Lamb. No reference to the mark of the beast. This we see later, in chapter 13, where the false prophet comes on the scene, performing false signs, instructing the earth dwellers to make an image of the beast, giving him breath so that it can speak. In verse 15 then it says that he causes as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is another wave of martyrs, this time connected to the refusal of worshipping the beast and taking his image. We see that in chapter 15, which is after the trumpet judgments and before the bowl judgments. There it says, starting from verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So, these are the ones who have been martyred for their faith and their refusal to worship the beast and take the mark. Here we are at the midpoint of the tribulation, three and a half years in, which is when the image of the beast is being set up in the temple. That is when the mark is being introduced, so it can in no way be around already now. It isn't even there yet at the first two waves of martyrs, at the time of the fifth seal, or after the sealing of the 144,000. Now to the question, why is it significant that the 144,000 are only sealed after the sixth seal and only start their ministry then? 
we all have unsaved family and friends who we have witnessed to and still are and who we are praying for. There are those who will not make up their minds to believe now, but will go into the tribulation. While it is true that the 144,000 are the main evangelists during those seven years, we have seen that they only come onto the scene sometime after the start of the tribulation, albeit during the first half. What does this mean for the martyrs of the fifth seal? From what we have established so far, they are not a fruit of their ministry. Here's what I believe. There are many who have heard the gospel but are still on the fence. They think they still have time and postpone this decision to a later date. Although things are getting really obvious at this point in terms of the concerted worldwide New World Order agendas developing and a dictatorial world government forming, we've just had the so-called World Government Summit take place at the end of March, many still have what's called a normalcy bias. Things can get a little shaky at times, maybe, but all in all, they will stay the same they always have. After the rapture and when the tribulation starts, they will realize it was all true what they were being told and believe. I believe this is them, the martyrs of the fifth seal, the first wave, and maybe also those whom they have told the gospel because they knew it. Once they have been martyred, the 144,000 take over. Of course, there are also the two witnesses in Jerusalem, and later an angel warning of the mark of the beast, and another one preaching the eternal gospel. So this is a comfort for the believer because this tells us that our prayers are not in vain and that the seed of the word that has been planted will bear its fruit in due time. Of course our prayers are not in vain. They work beyond the rapture. We see that in chapter 8 verses 3 through 5. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder, and sounds of flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. At this point, after the seals and before the trumpet judgments, the church is long since in heaven, of course. It does not say here, the prayers of the saints on the earth. No, it says all the saints. So, yes, I believe the prayers still continue to accomplish what they were meant for when the church was still on earth. They even contribute to the bringing about of judgment, as we see here thunder, lightning, and an earthquake. So nothing is in vain. Neither seeds that are planted now, nor prayers prayed. Paying close attention to every detail of the word uncovers many a precious truth we would not have imagined to find. Have a blessed day.